Our next panel uh, is on understanding and preventing insider threats. And this, I think, will be a great panel to help us all get some ideas in terms of how to detect and prevent these types of threats. And so we really appreciate the opportunity to learn um, from Judd and from Ryan today. Um, so we have two panelists today. The first is Judd Choate. And Dr. Judd Choate is Colorado State Election Director. And a, it, this is a position that he has held since 2009. Um, he has also served as the president of NASET in 2017. Uh, in a previous life, Judd was a scout for the Kansas City Royals. And then we have with us today Ryan Macias. And Ryan is a subject matter expert election security consultant to CISA, where he develops strate strategies and products for state, local, tribal, and territorial governments and the private sector partners in order to mitigate risks to critical infrastructure. From 2016 to 2019, Ryan also worked for the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, uh, the EAC, and most recently as the acting director of voting, testing, voting systems testing and certification. Before that, he served for more than 10 years with the California Secretary of State, developing and implementing legislation, policies, and procedures on tech election technology and security. So thank you so much, Judd and Ryan, for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you, NASED, for having us here today. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to get it out of the way first. Uh, for those of you that have noticed, yes, I lost 14 inches of hair uh, on Sunday, um, so I don't have to announce it again. Uh, I grew it out to donate it, and so um, the plan was actually to cut it before NAS, but I realized that I was on a panel with Matt Masterson, and he hates my long hair, so I kept it for one extra week and cut it before I came here and got in front of you all. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to, are we already up on screen? Um, so we're here today, uh, as Kim and Jeff spoke with you, uh, CISA developed a, uh, insider threat in elections guidance document. Um, and they talked about generally how we listen to you all in the community, hear your threats, hear your risks, um, and take that information in um, and build out guidance documents. Uh, this actually spun out of a conversation that uh, we had in Maryland at their association uh, meeting in 2020. Um, they were doing a presentation from CISA's uh, physical, or excuse me, Protective Security Advisor, PSA, uh, who was doing a, a presentation on insider threats in critical infrastructure generally. And uh, one of the things that we were hearing from elections officials at that association meeting was, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> there's some movement on screen right now that just threw me off. Um, the, uh, what we were hearing was obviously there was a concern or uh, a set of risks that you all were facing uh, around insider threats. And so they asked if there was a way that we could take the products that CISA already had for critical infrastructure writ large and make it for uh, the elections community specifically. Um, and what we ended up doing was developing the guidance document um, that Jeff and Kim referenced this morning, um, as well as a training. Uh, and so what you are seeing today is a preview uh, of that training. Um, but this is something that we go around uh, from state to state and can provide uh, the training for you and your elections officials, uh, either in person or um, virtually. Um, but again, we just wanted to, to open up the conversation here um, since it is something that I know many of you all are facing uh, across the nation right now. So um, this first slide uh, you know, talks just generally about critical infrastructure and that this is... Um, a threat that is not just specific to elections um, and kind of breaks down the different types of uh, risks and concerns that uh, you may face uh, through an insider threat. And I do not like to read slides, so I'm not going to, but uh, generally, again, we wanted to take a look at this and make you all aware that this is not unique to the elections industry. Um, this happens in every single organization. Um, and uh, more importantly is we wanted to 
highlight that so that we could then start to work with you all to understand where the risk lies for each and every one of you. Which gets me here. Um, you know, we are in a world where we have uh, a lot of people uh, that run elections. Uh, we have to bring on a lot of contracts, contractors, a lot of staff, um, and a lot of uh, volunteers um, who actually have access to critical assets um, and part of our critical infrastructure, uh, particularly out at the voting locations, including you know electronic poll books, um, the ballots themselves, um, and uh, you know voting systems, and, and so on and so forth. And so that opens up the opportunity for individuals to become an insider. Um, it is probably the unique to uh, most critical infrastructure areas. You don't hear about nuclear power plants that just let volunteers to come in and you know uh, uh, have access to their systems. Um, then you know then there's the other aspect of it, which is elections are just naturally transparent, and so we invite people in. Um, to show them our operations. And so, again, it may not even be the staff that we are looking at from an insider perspective, but it could be also uh, individuals that just are vol or that are allowed to come in um, the, and, and provide an opportunity uh, to create a concern or a threat. So what are the different types? Um, you know, when we think about uh, insider threats, uh, well, first is the definition and then the types of harm that they can create. But, um, you know, there's impacts to our organization, to our data, and to our personnel. So we have to think about it from all areas. Uh, the organization itself, uh, there's a reputational risk. Um, and then there's also just the, you know, the risk to, uh, to the organization or to the infrastructure of elections uh, process altogether. Then there's the data, um, and we'll get into some of that information, but you know, uh, malicious uh, in, people with malicious intent may try to get uh, uh, do a confidentiality attack um, and basically exfiltrate the data that you all have because again, uh, unlike many areas of uh, election, I mean of uh, critical infrastructure, we have PII um, that we are required to maintain and required um, to house, and so that could be data that people want to get gain access to. And then obviously there's you know just the the voting system and other types of data. But we also have our personnel, and so the threats to our personnel uh, has to be considered as well. And I really want to hit on this one pretty hard because um, we think about when we talk about insider threat our mind naturally goes to those with malintent, somebody who is trying to do something uh, bad. Uh, and we don't necessarily think about ourselves from an insider threat perspective. But uh, one of the things that we really wanted to drive home is what we're hearing from elections officials, and you guys are all very well aware of this, but um, is, you know, we have the attrition rates. We have people that are under threat um, from the community, people that are getting death threats, people that are overworked, uh, what I like to call the operational uh, denial of service attack through all your FOIA requests, um, and uh, all the things that are happening to each and every one of you that are taking you away from doing some of the things that you could be doing to implement new security practices. And so through all of that, we have to consider ourselves uh, also from an in, uh, unintentional insider threat perspective because we can make mistakes. Uh, we can have, um, again, just from the, being tired, uh, new staff that are coming in uh, out, out of that attrition rates, uh, people that have not been trained up. And so, again, I just want to like hit home that we need to be thinking of ourselves as well um, when we are thinking of the insider threat, and, and you'll hear that when I get to the mitigations uh, in just a minute. Then there's the intentional. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have to think about here, again, I already talked about the type of people that could come into it, but we have to think about our third party threats as well, our contractors um, working with our vendors and the and contractors that we work with to ensure that they have mitigative measures put into place um, so that their staff that are assisting us um, are not part of the insider threat. 
Um, and then, you know, and then there's the co collusion aspect of it. Um, and you can see all the types of things that could occur um, through the intentional threats, and, and I'm going to hit on those in just a minute. So here's the types of expressions, and again, um, just kind of running them down. Obviously, there's the cybersecurity incidents, uh, which is what we think about most. Um, there's violence. Um, and so we have to be uh, worried and concerned about potential uh, insiders creating violence inside of our organization. There's the es espionage aspect. Uh, again, we have, um, we have critical assets. We have copies of voting system data. We have uh, personal identifiable information and um, other types of uh, data that somebody may want to gain access to. Um, then there's just outright sabotage. Um, and last is, is theft. And I think about this one uh, all the time because, you know, we've got USB sticks. They may not even, somebody may not know that they're stealing uh, critical infrastructure. They just see a USB. We have e poll books that run on your off the shelf tablets. We've got voting systems that are just computers. And again, um, somebody may be taking this data not for the purpose of sabotage or espionage or even to create a cybersecurity incident, they may just be trying to steal it um, for the purpose of a financial gain. Then we have our information environment. Um, we all know too well uh, the, the MDM that is out there, the misdis and malinformation, and the narratives that those can pose. And so again, thinking about um, what this can cause. This can create some of our staff or some of our volunteers uh, to, uh, cr to basically spread mis -dis and malinformation um, and uh, use that as an insider threat. Um, but it also is they are going to be targeted just as we are. We have seen our staff get targeted with MDM to try to basically make them an insider threat. We've seen a breakdown of, of staff and, and um, so on and so forth. Uh, but then there's just, again, there's those, those stressors. Um, and that MDM is weighing upon all of us. And so there is the concern um, that you know, we may uh, become that unintentional threat based on the types of uh, misdis and malinformation that is being posed upon us. And I will talk about some of the mitigative measures on that as well. Most importantly here is I wanna start with the mitigations. And the good news is most of this is, are things that we already do. Um, and so our standard operating procedures and standard operating procedures are very important, and I really want to highlight this one because, again, we've seen the attrition. We have a lot of turnover in staff. We have new people that are coming in. And so having standard operating procedures, one, is a training mechanism so that we don't have that unintentional threat, but it also helps with the intentional. If you are having somebody who is continuously doing something wrong, um, that is a detective measure. And so uh, you, you can give them the training and say, why aren't you following the standard operating procedure? It is something that you can train all of your staff to look out for, is, you know, are, is somebody continuously not following a standard operating procedure? If so, we need to give them additional training. And if they continue to do it, we may need to be thinking about this as, uh, as a potential insider. The next is access control. Um, again, uh, you know, on a previous slide, it was talking about the piggybacking, uh, you know, using key card access uh, and, you know, having controls that are in place to know who has access to specific data. And my favorite example in elections is actually back in 2007 uh, during the top to bottom review of voting systems. Um, I'll never forget this day. Uh, the very, very first day, we had a ton of media and uh, Secretary of State Bowen at the time. Um, went down to our white floor uh, where we were doing the testing, which was my testing lab, and had about 10 members of the media following her. She went and put her badge against the key card, and it denied her access. She tried it again. It denied her access. She called me, number one, frantic, and number two, irate, um, and telling me, you know, why couldn't she get in? This was her building, so on and so forth. And I said there was no need for her to actually need to get in there. And so um, she wasn't going in to do the testing and it showed a measure of security that we had put into place. It was only those who needed access to the room that had the necessary access. And after, the, after that, she pulled me in uh, a room, 
again, I thought I was getting fired. Um, and the headline came out that night. Top to bottom review, so secure, secretary cannot access her own building. Um, the very next day, she said thank you, um, and, and everything turned around. But again, having those types of access controls and knowing who is accessing a different type of uh, information will allow you to be able to detect and recover uh, should an insider threat uh, occur. Next is chain of custody. Again, just building on those chain of custody practices. I'm not going to dig in that one. Um, and then there's the zero trust security model. And uh, this is a weird one when we talk to elections officials, they're like, wait, zero trust, wait, I am the trusted source. Uh, we have trusted information. Uh, we even have a hashtag around that. And so what is the zero trust model? And again, I'm gonna go back to my entire career in elections has been around the zero trust model. When I came into elections, the very first thing that I heard was we need to have a paper backup. This is back in 2005, we're talking about it. And why? because we may not trust the voting systems or we don't have to rely upon the trust of the voting system. We don't have to rely upon the software. And again, so we had that analog and we were building out a zero trust model before it was even cool. Um, you know, this is the new talking point in cybersecurity or it's been reinvigorated uh, in the last couple of years is around zero trust, zero trust, zero trust. Well, elections are naturally built around a zero trust model. We have two person teams. Why? So that one another can check each other. We have, and typically a bipartisan um, team. And so again, like this is just something that we build into our model um, on an ongoing basis. So here's just a couple things, um, again, that you can implement for that are mitigative measures. So codes of conduct. Again, I had talked about we have to bring in volunteers. We have to bring in temporary staff, having a code of conduct for them. So you can hold them accountable and be able to uh, go after them if you see something that is, uh, doesn't look right. Uh, you can see SOPs, security cameras, um, two-person rule. I just talked about that. Uh, the one I want to hit on here, though, is uh, identifying items, uh, lanyards, badges, vests, uh, or as I talked to Wayne yesterday in Nebraska uh, about, is we could all wear our elections Nebraska socks, and that could be our like lanyard. Um, and and yes, I said that because I do not have a pair of socks. And he told me if I mentioned it today, I would get a pair. And and he's not here. And so. Um, I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just holding you accountable to uh, uh, make sure I get my socks because uh, we were just talking about them uh, in my presentation. Um, but, uh, you know, again, restrictive uh, use or, or eliminating remote access, um, and it's hard in today's world when we are all, you know, working remotely, but ensuring that only the necessary access is there. Um, and then, like I you know, mandatory background checks and so on and so forth. These are just a few of the things that you can, you can go ahead and implement uh, as compensating controls. And again, uh, in elections, most of these, if not all of these things, are already being implemented. So um, there's an aspect here of building resilience to the MDM. Um, and the main thing here is establishing an organizational culture that is res resilient against the insider threat, is having an opportunity for people to speak out and people to be able to come out and talk about these types of things. We were talking earlier, like around the vulnerability disclosure, around the CPE uh, program, and so on and so forth, is how do we get this information out and how do we share this information? Because once we know the information, we can do something about it. And so, um, but in terms of like MDM specifically, having that shared sense of community, and we talk about this all the time, the people that are doing this are our neighbors, they're our church members, they're our Kiwanis Club members, they're our friends. And so again, building that sense of community and having them understand what the facts are so that they can help and uh, mitigate that MDM risk, but also then they understand if there is a colleague or or another uh, employee that is speaking out against that. Um, and they can try, number one, to train them on what is the fact. Um, and if they continue to hear it again, then you can start to do something about it. Um, and the, the proactively and consistently being transparent, again, opening up our processes, allowing people to see what is going on. And then most importantly is training and education. 
And I just hit on this a minute ago, but building a culture of reporting. And so having a positive and open culture, having somebody in your HR or having somebody in your uh, security team, that their job is to allow for people to report this information. And again, we take credible threats and we investigate them. We talk about that all the time in elections, is when things are reported to us, we are going to investigate it and find out whether or not it is truthful, whether or not, you know, we're going to run it down. And we've seen that time and time again uh, in our community. And so, um, you know, being transparent and, and informing individuals that we're going to allow for these reports to come in and we're going to investigate them um, should, they, uh, should they come in. And, um, and then understanding that there's a difference between whistleblowing and insider threat. And so again, building that culture that, you know what, we are going to take credible threats and we're going to investigate them and we're going to run it down the pathway. And that, um, is, there is a difference there, uh, through that formal process. And in conclusion is just, uh, you know, building a positive and supportive culture. Again, having that opportunity to be able to report. Uh, having that transparency and being consistent with our messaging, uh, ha talking about that shared mission that we have, and then uh, reporting and intervening early. So again, getting out in front of it when things are detected. And then if something is detected, making sure that you have a debrief. And not just with the people that may be the, who may be the insider, but also with the rest of your staff and having an opportunity to be able to share what actually occurred and having those conversations um, with the rest of your staff to inform them that, you know, we are taking this seriously. We're, if it is detected, we have a uh, response and, and recovery mechanism. And here is what we ended up doing uh, with our incident response plan, basically, um, to debrief you all and let you know uh, what the situation may be. And with that, uh, here's my information, but I'm actually going to kick it over to Judd uh, to start his, and then we will uh, open up after. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so Colorado had uh, an in not, not so much an insider threat, but an insider incident. Uh, we actually had uh, a couple, but one that became very public. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can Google it and you'll find it in about two seconds. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm not going to talk to you a lot about that because uh, you can easily find that. I think it's much more interesting to kind of uh, look at what Colorado did as a response to it. So uh, we did, we passed two bills in this last legislative session, uh, SB 153 and HB 1273, if you're interested, SB is Senate bill and House bill. So. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the elements of those bills. There were four major provisions that uh, spoke to the threat um, from potential uh, inside, you know, incidences uh, in the 153, and I'll go through each of those, uh, but this is just a slide kind of summarizing those. Um, then there were also five election improvements. Uh, that weren't so much directed at insider threats, but um, were more uh, just trying to address problems that we saw in elections, which kind of come from that misdisinformation area, and then also uh, from the um, you know uh, kinds of people who also present the insider threats. And then uh, the other side of the coin to um, insider threats is. Uh, threats made to elections officials. And so, um, and frankly, uh, those are interestingly related because uh, you are either uh, sort of on the camp of those people who um, are susceptible to mis and disinformation, can kind of be co-opted by that, manipulated by the sort of grifters that are working in that, um, in that space and, and become an insider threat. And then there are the people that are sort of actively targeted by the uh, people on the election denial side. Uh, and uh, those people need to be protected. So those were, we were trying to sort of walk that line. We were trying to both address insider threats, but we were also trying to do uh, things related to protecting our election officials. So uh, we passed uh, House Bill 1273, which was uh, outlined a couple of different protections, and I'll talk about those as well. All right, so let's go through uh, SB 153. Um, 
I saw this uh, cartoon and I really liked it. Uh, it, it really, if you think about it, um, after 2016, this was um, my experience, you may have had a similar experience. Uh, we spent 2017, 2018, 2019 preparing for the Russians and the Chinese. And uh, we, we thought we were okay on the insider threat um, area, but um, we, di we frankly did not spend a ton of time on it. We had already built that into our rules. We knew we had statutes that addressed it. We figured we were okay there. Uh, we were uh, more focused on uh, the international threat. Um, turns out uh, we had some work to do on the insider. So what we did with SB uh, 153 uh, was we did a series of uh, sort of corrections to our law. The first that um, is probably most focused on the particular incident that you might be aware of, it dealt with tampering with voting system equipment and, and or leaking passwords. So uh, we created the crime of tampering with or uh, the unauthorized access to voting equipment. Um, we also added the offense of knowingly sharing passwords uh, related to that equipment. Uh, that's a class four felony now. It's punishable by two to six years in prison and a $500,000 fine, up to a $500,000 fine. So that went from not in the law, basically, or in the law in a way that wasn't focused at elections, to now being a class four felony. So um, when somebody does it from here on out, it's a very, very serious crime. It's a crime that, frankly, uh, would uh, significantly alter somebody's life. Uh, we also put restrictions on imaging voting system equipment. Um, so this is, if, if, a lot of people that are sort of that insider threat group, uh, that's what their main focus is, is on. They're, they're worried about voting systems and they want to know all the information related to voting systems and so they're interested in imaging them. Now, what this word imaging means in the context of a voting system is kind of um, kind of new to this uh, into new to our world, what we did in this law was we clarified what an election record was, and particularly that it was not an image of uh, the voting system, the drive, the hard drive of a voting system. Uh, so we um, we we sort of clarified that, and then we also uh, said that SB 153 uh, barred the un unauthorized images of a voting system hard drive. Uh, we could um, uh, evaluate a request from the county and approve that as long as the county was able to cite a legitimate reason uh, to uh, have an image of the um, voting system and then they would have to coordinate with us. I honestly cannot imagine what that would be um, but, you know, we wanted to put a provision in there where maybe there's a future scenario where that is important. Uh, so that's sort of the waiver side of that. But for the most part, uh, we were laying down a law uh, saying you really can't image uh, your voting system hard drive. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to address, and this could be um, a, a, a vendor or multiple vendors could address this on uh, on their own, but I'm not going to address the civil side of this because there are civil potential pot potentialities related to this these activities uh, that I'm describing. I'm really only going down the criminal route, um, and a lot of our laws and adjustments to our laws relate to the criminal side. All right, so another thing that we required under 153 was video surveillance and keyless entry for any area that has uh, your stored voting system equipment. So now uh, all voting system, system equipment in the state of Colorado must be under 24-7, 365 or 366 uh, video surveillance and key card access uh, for storage between elections. So a couple of things, there is an historical building exception uh, where uh, it's not feasible. Uh, I've been to every county election office in the state. I'm not aware of a county where, where there really should be a historic building exception. So one's going to really have to argue and make a persuasive case on that. Because I think that this is possible in every um, uh, jurisdiction in the state. 
We also had a million dollar grant fund uh, which would offset these costs because we anticipate that the counties are going to have to do three things here. The first is install video cameras where they currently don't have them. Uh, the second is uh, install keyless entry where they clear, clear, uh, currently don't have them. And then uh, storage. So they're going to have to store those images because we're no longer uh, storing it for uh, 45 days prior to the election and 30 days after or whatever your law might be. But now it's 365 days. And uh, obviously that could be quite an intensive storage. And for that reason, we needed to uh, make funds available to uh, add that server capacity. Um, we also added to the definition of election physical security requirements, making these records, both the records of entry on the key card, but then also the video surveillance, we made those into election records. So that, under our law, means 25 months. Under pretty much everybody else, it means 22 months. But you're storing that, those images, you're storing that information for a very long time. And for that reason, we knew we needed to apply a lot of money. Uh, it is, we do allow one frame per minute of until a motion is detected. So uh, once motion is detected, then it's continuous recording until motion ceases. Uh, so, so we're not talking about 24-7 continuous recording. We are uh, strongly encouraging counties to move to motion detection um, uh, equipment. And this does not apply to voting locations. And the reason why is because often uh, voting locations are not under county control. So uh, I think a, a, a reasonable criticism of this law would be, well, uh, you're only talking about the 350 days a year when it's in uh, a room somewhere. You're not talking about the 15 days when it's out for a major election. And I think that that's fair. And I suspect that in the coming years we'll address that as well, and maybe even this coming year, because it is a bit of a gap, but it would have required more funding and the sort of mobile access to video cameras and being able to take them with you and then having the server capacity to have that on the move. And uh, we just weren't ready to do that and we knew it would be expensive. So that might be stage two. Another thing in 153 related to insider threats was something we call proximity to voting equipment. So previously we had a statute that elected officials in political subdivisions of over 100,000 people. So that's 11 of our largest counties were not, um, were not permitted to physically touch voting equipment. We have extended this to the uh, same group of people that they can't have key uh, card access to be or be alone in the room with voting system equipment, um, except to vote, <laughs> which <laughs> makes sense if they want to vote on a piece of equipment, they can. Um, or if the equipment is deployed at a voter service and polling center, that's what we call uh, vote centers and uh, they are actively engaged as a political worker. So, um, so that's, and we'll actually talk about political worker here in a minute because we actually made some definitional changes on some stuff related to that. So we created those exceptions, but for the most part, this, this was to extend that prohibition of elected county clerks uh, to stay away from voting systems. Um, for the most part, we're talking about large counties that have large staffs or pretty large staffs. Uh, they're not people who are engaged in the day-to-day -day working of uh, the voting equipment anyway, so just stay away from it. You don't have key card access to the room. You can't operate it. You can't touch it. That's basically what we've said in that law. Okay, so now we go to some election improvements. So these were things not really related to insider threats, but, you know, close enough that we could get it under the broad title of this bill and it would improve uh, how elections function in Colorado. Uh, we added disqualifications to serve as DEO. So uh, for those of you that DEO is an unfamiliar term, it's designated election official. So uh, if you have been convict convicted of an election offense uh, specified in Colorado statute or a similar offense in a different state, or if you've been convict uh, convicted of committing uh, or conspiracy to commit sedition, insurrection, treason, conspiracy, to overthrow the government or a similar federal offense, 
you cannot serve as a DEO in the state of Colorado. That second series of terms uh, might be familiar to you if you've been watching you know, news television recently. Uh, so um, so we're, we were pretty specific in trying to kind of identify uh, people that we really thought were inappropriate to serve as a designated election official in Colorado. Uh, certification. So uh, we have a certification program. You, a, a different term for certification might be training. So uh, we have a training program in the state of Colorado. We certify our election, uh, our county clerks and our election workers. And what this did was it more uh, specifically outlined those certification requirements. I kind of outlined them here, but basically you can be certified to run an election if you uh, take a certain number of classes. They are right now 13 classes. Those classes average around four hours in length. So uh, it's quite a, an involved process to become certified in Colorado. They're very specific. There's like one on uh, our voting, our, uh, voter registration database, there's one on how your voting system works, there's one on uh, how to deal with UOCAVA voters, there's one on uh, registration and update, there's, you know, so we have all across the gamut of the things that we do, and each person that's certified to be a DEO in the state of Colorado must uh, take those. Uh, that did not apply to county clerks prior to this law, and now it does apply to county clerks. I cite as an example there, we did have a county clerk who had never completed certification courses but did serve as a DEO in the 2020 election. That can never happen again in the state of Colorado until uh, or unless that law were changed. Uh, this section does not bar someone from being a county clerk. Even if they haven't done that, they just can't be the DEO. So they can't be the designated election official. And we do have sort of a waiver function there where if a county clerk is just not in the situation where they can serve as a DEO, they and we can work together to identify the appropriate person either in their office or perhaps not in their office who can be appointed to serve in that role. We actually have that happening right now or did happen in the state primary because uh, we had a county clerk who resigned in the middle of her term. This is a person you've never heard of and not read about. Uh, she retired, uh, re uh, resigned in the middle of her term, and then we had a person that filled that position, and she, frankly, uh, she just did not have time to complete those 13 courses. And because of that, uh, she could not serve as a DEO for that primary, and, um, uh, but we were able to uh, sign somebody, and it, everything worked out. They ran a great election. Another election improvement, uh, criminal penalties for disobeying a Secretary of State order. Uh, so the Secretary of State does have the power to order under um, a provision of our statute. Uh, we didn't change that. Basically what 153 does is adds an expedited, uh, expedited judicial review uh, so that we can get in front of a judge fast. And it creates criminal penalties for the violation of an SOS order where it involves uh, uh, general violations of, of uh, significant merit and then also a violation of our acceptable use policy. So we have an acceptable use policy for people who use our voter registration database. And if they violate, um, you know, with a significant violation of our um, score, which is our voter registration database, uh, a significant uh, violation of the acceptable use policy, that would be a criminal offense which could uh, rise to a class one misdemeanor. Uh, which is a possible jail time of 364 days, not more, a, and or a $1,000 uh, fine. Uh, also on the improvement side, counties must count ballots with certified voting equipment. Uh, this is a, a provision of our state statute that um, a couple of you have asked about. Uh, I think it's probably, of all the things that we're talking about in this law, the most important part, uh, because uh, the counties, and I actually mentioned this as the third bullet under, under this, uh, the counties brought this to our attention. And it's because so many in the advocacy world, the election denial world, were, um, were badgering them about doing hand counts. And uh, they just really didn't have anything to fall back on. 
They didn't have anything in law or rule which um, forced them to, do, to use their voting equipment to, to scan their ballots. And so this law allowed uh, for the counties to have that uh, you know, backstop to say to a person that was trying to get them to do a hand count, no, I cannot do that. I am not uh, permitted to do that under state statute. We do have an exception for very small counties, uh, counties with fewer than 1,000 active voters, of which we have three. So 61 counties will have to do um, all uh, uh, scan tally. And then three counties are permitted to do hand count. They don't have to do a hand count. They all have scanners. They can use scanners if they want to. But the other 61 are required to. And the reason why we wanted to do this was uniformity of process, not, not just uh, because we have all this evidence. And I, you know, believe me, you all live in this world. You know there's all this evidence that people can't count and that uh, people cannot, they can't work together to look at the same piece of paper and come up with the same result. It's not possible. They just don't have the ability to do it. And it's, they're not bad people. It's just hard. And you look at page after page after page, and your mind just goes to mush. And so uh, that's why you have pieces of equipment like this. You have scanners to do that very work. And so this brings about a uniformity of process that we think is just better. So uh, it does not apply to non-Title I elections, so municipal elections, school board elections, special district elections. If those are run outside of Title I, then hey, go for it. If you want to do a hand count, that's not up to us. Uh, but uh, in the world I live in, I've got counties, I've got a couple of counties that have 450 styles of ballots in a major election. So if you have 450 uh, styles of ballots and you have 300,000 cast ballots in those counties, just try to hand count those uh, with any kind of measure of accuracy. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And so we're scanning for totals now based on this provision. You can only hand count if you have a hardware or software breakdown. Uh, we did have, I uh, cite the Montrose County um, example. So in 2020 in the primary, uh, Montrose County uh, created their ballot issued their ballots to UOCAVA voters, then figured out they had a problem with one of those uh, vote for two scenarios. And uh, so they had to revise their ballots, but they could not go back and, and uh, scan those revised ballots um, under you know, the original build of that election. And so for that reason, they had to hand count 14,000 ballots, and, uh, or 8,000 ballots. And, uh, it, that was a very painful operation. Uh, they did a fantastic job of it. It took them nine days. We were there the whole time. They had four tables of four people working continuously for nine days to complete 8,000 ballots. It was um, you know, quite an intensive lift, but they were able to get through it. And uh, it's kind of an example of why you don't do this. You, know, you scan your ballot. Um, and then you're also permitted to hand count ballots after your certified totals. So if you want to do a hand count after you've certified your totals just to show everybody that the count was right, go for it. But to do your certified totals, you have to scan them. All right, so uh, last, I think, of the election improvements was uh, we added a provision about canvas of votes cast. So if a canvas board uh, could not come to an agreement, but we had a good faith basis to believe that the votes were accurately tallied in that county, uh, then we could approve the canvas without the canvas board's approval. Um, you might have uh, seen this happen in, uh, I think, New Mexico. Don't pick on Mandy, yeah. Uh, that, uh, that they had a problem like that. Uh, we, we actually had passed this law before that, but we were really uh, pleased that we had this law once that happened. We were like, oh yeah, we were worried about that. Uh, so that's kind of an example. Okay, I'll get through these other ones quick. Uh, House Bill 1273, this is the election protection. So this is trying to protect the other side of the coin. Um, this, uh, I think, will all uh, resonate with you. Uh, these, this was our experience in 2020, and we're trying to prevent this or mitigate it to some degree going forward. So some of the protections that we did, uh, we defined who our people were here. We have election workers. Those are 
me and the county folks that work for the county that are full-time employees um, and anybody at the Secretary of State's office. And then election officials, these are people who are temporary employees or judges or poll workers, uh, but we, that was important for us to define those two groups of people so that we could provide them somewhat different protections. We did a doxing law. So it turns out doxing, even in, in its most egregious manner, is typically not illegal. Um, but if we now have a law which under 1273 creates uh, Ill illegality in doxing if it's for the purpose of intimidating and harassing. So um, it's really uh, sort of a, um, a mens rea now that we've uh, put to it. Doxing generally is legal, but if you're doing it to intimidate or harass, then it's illegal. Uh, so we, um, we, again, differentiated on election workers and election officials. We ended up in the end in, in of the bill, we ended up adding both of those sets of people to the group of people who would be protected by doxing. And this would again be uh, your class one misdemeanor up to $1,000 in 364 days. Uh, we also did a protected person's informa personal information, so PII. Uh, if an election worker um, uh, wants to, they can protect all of their government PII so uh, they, there's sort of one-stop shopping at the governor's office where they, they will issue a mandate to all the agencies to say that all of the, uh, this person's PII needs to be protected because they're an election worker. And then uh, interference with the active performance of duties. Uh, so uh, 1270 or 1273 uh, creates a crime for interfering with an election official or an election worker. Election official is sort of the uh, Venn diagram, lesser included. Uh, prior statutes treated election officials just like normal citizens, but now it's a, um, if you're coerced or intimidated or threatened while performing your duties or in retaliation for performing your duties, uh, that can be a class two misdemeanor, uh, 120 days in jail and a $750 fine or both. So, those were the things that we did in Colorado to address insider threat and then also try to fix some of the holes that were in our uh, election laws um, related to sort of the bad side but also protecting election officials. Uh, I think we're open for questions now. Be before we go to questions, one thing I failed to say uh, during my presentation is <clears throat> one of the things that we heard from uh, elections officials uh, across the country uh, at CISA when we were providing the training, including um, you know what I just showed on the insider threat, was thank you for all this information. It's a lot of information. Um, we uh, appreciate it. We don't want to have to listen to it again. We uh, need something that's a takeaway. Um, and something that can kind of summarize the information. And so with all of the trainings that uh, CISA is providing now, including the ransomware, the phishing, building trust through secure practices and insider threats, is we've actually created these cool little postcards that actually summarize the entire presentation so that you can leave them on your desk and be able to refer to them. And so I'm gonna pass these around just for the main table, but there is a stack of them in the CISA booth uh, in the room next door as well. Great. Well, thank you both so much. That was really informative. And thank you for uh, presenting a complicated and sensitive subject with a lot of information about kind of how we move forward in a really productive way. So thank you for that. Um, now let's open it up to questions. I'm sure there's many. Mandy. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. So bear with me. Um, we, I'm using the word we metaphorically, of course. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing Ryan all the things that you've said right we're we're checking all of the boxes you know for the security thing and um we're you know mitigated you know doing everything that we can to mitigate inside our threats you know external threats you name it right and we're trying to do what Judd is doing as well right which is you know um, understanding where there may or may not be gaps in the law or um, administrative code or directives or whatever to to address how how do we ultimately handle bad actors right externally or internally um, within the election infrastructure 
I am really concerned, you know, and, and Judd, I just, I want to, you talked about state law, right? Your state law and what was under, you know, in, within the realm of possibility and reality for you guys to amend the state law in the state of Colorado to, to address these things. You know, I'm really concerned about the lack of updates to federal law um, on this uh, particular issue. Um, yes, we all know elections is critical infrastructure since 2017, but has the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act been updated to address what we are in real time seeing? Um, and, and I think the answer is no. I looked it up. Um, I, I, I think you know I pulled up the AUSA Guide to Prosecuting Cyber Crimes, um, and I'm really concerned about this serious disconnect between the FBI. Okay, we have election crime coordinators now. Great, you know, excellent. But where is the law going? Where is the law going? And where it, it, there's this disconnect between DOJ and prosecuting these things that we've done. We've done everything that you've said, Ryan, right? Like we've, we've attempted to do this, but it, does the law need to be updated so that there is actually the ability to prosecute, you know, these, these crimes um, and to deal with it? Because what, what we're really showing the public is, in essence, if we don't prosecute these, you can get away with it, right? And it's really not that big of a deal and it's really not that big of a priority. Um, so I have a lot of concerns about that and I think that's an emerging area that we as election officials really need to focus on because you know, not all of us, Judd, are as lucky as you who can amend the state law you know, that quickly to address something like this and we are dependent on certain federal statutes to, to address these issues. Um, and so I really encourage you all to really think about that um, are we just running into a brick wall um, for an outcome that's necessary um, to to address the, the the climate that we're in right now? Um, and it's something I'm very like, you know, I, I think is, you know, putting my nerdy lawyer hat on. It's really important, right? Like, I mean, in, in a certain very public example that you referenced that I don't want to spend a lot of time on, you know, are you going to, you know, bash your head against a wall because technically she was an election official and technically she had authorized access. I mean, that's a huge question mark. Um, and I can't find in the reporting, Judd, if she it was ultimately indicted federally or, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your attorney general and at the state level. So yeah. anyways, I'm raising a lot. I'm very passionate about this topic. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. It's the perfect merge of you know, the cybersecurity, the real life threats that we're dealing with, and then the law or lack thereof on this matter. Yeah, I'll just uh, say the incident that happened in Colorado, uh, which you more than welcome to look up and find out more information about, uh, no laws related to voting equipment uh, are, have been, uh, she hasn't been indicted for any of those. She's not accused of violating any of those. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, because they don't exist or they're, they're uh, so wishy-washy that they're kind of impossible to apply. And the reason why we went for a local fix was because we have no faith whatsoever that the federal government will address it. And I'm not going to speak to the federal law aspect of it, but um, I am going to highlight the uh, election threat election personnel threat uh, response guide that uh, Kim and Jeff mentioned this morning. And one of the purposes for that document, again, not necessarily around the insider threat, but about threats to elections officials, was to be able to highlight your state laws um, that are already in place and to one, work with your, um, with your local law enforcement to inform them as well. And I have to give a lot of credit to Amy on this. It started a, as a conversation that she and I had along with one of your former colleagues who may be working in law enforcement now um, of uh, you know highlighting how do we actually work with the elections community, one, to make them aware of what laws are already on the books, where the gaps may be so that you can go and try to pass uh, new laws, but also as an education um, to the law enforcement themselves and to uh, your attorney generals, to your DAs, to all of those type of people to say, this is in the law. And again, that's not necessarily on the federal side of it, but that is a, a mechanism that uh, we as CISA have um, created as part of our last mile uh, initiative so that we can help you identify what those items are, customize them, and get that information out. 
So I had a question. Um, this was something that we had talked about earlier in our regional meeting where one of our concerns is um, where we have state laws that require a specific way in which election uh, poll workers are appointed. And in some of those instances, it is requesting list of party members from local political committees. Um, and, you know, has there been, do you have any recommendations on how to create kind of a code of conduct where one isn't necessarily in the law and that there are certain procedures that have to take place when there may be a name that's submitted or a person that is on a list that's submitted that clearly isn't qualified because they would not pass some of these checks, but we don't have a law that says we can do these things. So, I mean, my fear is, you know, it's always trying to balance what does our state law allow for and at what point will we get sued if we try to put into a, some sort of policy where we're not going to get a state law change when we do put in a policy that says, you know, you don't have to use someone if this. Um, so if you have any recommendations on something like that, because I do think that's something that is a relatively new issue that we are seeing at least. We haven't seen something like this as an issue um, until just the past couple of years. The only thing that I will say is just in general IT security, um, you know, one of the best practices is to have a banner uh, that says, you know, that this is for authorized use only. Um, and so having something like that on, on a computer, so like an e-poll book, uh, or even on a um, voting system or any type of uh, electronic device that uh, they may be u utilizing, um, is just normal practice um, that doesn't address some of the MDM uh, and other aspects uh, that you may be talking about. But uh, in terms of, of a code of conduct, if you don't have a law that allows you to implement a code of conduct, just recognizing that, you know what, if there's IT best practices that you were just implementing and following, um, that, that may be a way to go ahead and, and move forth with it. And that was some, one of the things that, that um, got chopped that was in our bill. The uh, the one one thing we can kind of fall back on is is we have an oath requirement, and so everybody has to swear an oath, and then there's a penalty for violating the oath. So that's kind of a broad way of addressing that. But I, I'm with you. I'm I'm worried about you know some of the people being put forth as judges. Uh, there are names we've never heard of. There's names that the counties have never heard of, and these are. You know, in many respects, we're talking about um, county clerks who are very steeped in local politics who have never heard of people that are being nominated as their, as their uh, election judges. Uh, that's worrisome. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is probably going to play out in this uh, upcoming election. We had a, we had a couple of um, uh, election judges that were dismissed in a county uh, in 2021 for doing... Um, for having crazy numbers on signature verification for mail ballots, where they were just throwing out like ballot after ballot after ballot after ballot. And uh, they had no basis for it. And fortunately, uh, we make the counties keep those numbers. And so when they saw numbers that were uh, way out of whack, they dismissed those judges. But that's, we're probably going to have to do it on a sort of one off basis like that. The other thing that I'd go back to is, is standard operating procedures and training. Um, you know, implementing things into your poll worker training um, and or into like standard operating procedures that you may be able to educate them about um, in hopes that they're going to follow it. And uh, again, just as uh, you would with an employee who uh, is not following uh, normal procedures, um, have an opportunity to be able to remove them um, if possible. And so, uh, again, like I would just go back to um, some of those uh, basic things as well. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, thank you, Judd and uh, Ryan, so much for being here. Uh, that was really helpful.